Hi class, in this lecture we are going to do an overview of the Cuban culture. So we already know from earlier last year that when Columbus came to this part of the world, he didn't discover anything. There were already plenty of cultures and civilizations already set up in the Americas and the Caribbean. So Columbus just made it as far to uh, some of the Caribbean islands there, Cuba being one of those. So of course, he encountered the indigenous Cuban people. And we know that the Spanish colonized Latin America and the Caribbean islands and even, you know, parts of North America, because we have to remember that pretty much the whole from Texas to California, you know, the whole southwestern, central southwestern part of the United States was, um, you know, part of Mexico. And then, of course, here in the age of exploration, the 1400s, that was uh, Mexico and it was part of the like uh, the Incan culture, I believe, and there are a bunch of other Native American cultures. But my point is, is that we know that the Spanish, when they colonized these areas, um, they, they were they came to America for gold and riches and uh, to Christian uh, to evangelize, right? And so we know that one of the main reasons they set up colony in Latin America and the Caribbean islands were for economic reasons and uh, that main economic product being sugar, especially on the island of Cuba. So um, in order to maintain those sugar uh, plantations and to exert themselves as a dominant world power. You know, it, the plantations were very brutal work and so slavery was a big part of that. And so thus we see the beginning of the Atlantic sl uh, transatlantic slave system and we see hundreds upon thousands of African Americans being transported to these countries. All right, so we, oh, excuse me. So let's fast forward just a few centuries here. And as the Spanish are dominating the Caribbeans and Latin America, they're, uh, you know, setting up this part of the world as being a, uh, you know, major trade area, you know, major trade products, um, we start you see the Latin American and Caribbean cultures rebelling, especially when it comes to the issue of slavery. We see the American Revolution, French Revolution, the 1700s was really what I consider to be the age of revolution because people all over the world were standing up to their uh, European overlords and saying no more. And, uh, you know, doing this sort of self-determinism and uh, choosing to create their own destinies. And so we really see that in Latin American and the Caribbean, uh, Caribbeans because of the end of slavery there. You know, even before slaves were freed in uh, North America, revolutions were um, happening down in the Caribbean, like with the Haitian Revolution and, uh, you know, really sparked off the end of the slave system. However, because these areas had been under that system for so long, they were still economically dependent upon sugar. And now in forming their independence as new nations, they you know, they, they had to assert themselves on the world stage to be taken seriously by the Europeans. And uh, by now, the United States had formed, you know, the 17, uh, 1800s. And um, 
And so in order for the United States to assert itself as a dominant world power, it starts looking towards Latin America and the Caribbeans. And also the United States wanted to dominate this part of the world. And, and they have this isolation stance. They believe, you know, they gained their independence from Europe. Anything that happened over on that continent was like their problem. It didn't have anything to do with us. That's one of the reasons why um, we didn't actively go to war when uh, World War I started. It took a few years before America to get involved. Another reason is because we were create America was creating its own wars with Mexico, Latin America, the Caribbean islands, you know, we see the Cuban Revolution, you know, they're, they're just once again revolutions with all these different cultures and nations trying to exert their independence. And then, you know, there, there's kind of interrelational fighting too, because everybody's trying to carve out their own little piece of the land. So back to the picture in America, right? So this is basically a satirical political cartoon that is expressing American in imperialism in the Caribbeans and Latin America. Now I know, so what we see is Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam, um, especially, it, it, you know, here during imperialism is when this figure really started to show up and it's basically this symbol of who America is. You know, Uncle Sam is this kindly elderly gentleman. Actually think like Colonel Sanders, but in like an American type uniform. You know, this just kindly elderly man that is just uh everybody's friend you know he's not your dad because your dad is the parent the authoritarian you know they're the one your dad's going to be the one that's going to punish you whereas the uncle is kind of the good guy the uncle is going to be on your side yet he will reprimand you when appropriate and you guys you know I would, everybody that has uncles or uncles in laws, you, you know the difference between the, those types of authority um, uh, uh, figures in your life, be it as a child or as an adult. Well, you know, so with American imperialism, once again, this Uncle Sam, it was, you know, he's your buddy, but, you know, if he has to, don't, don't make him like exert his. Dominant. So that's why we see Uncle Sam depicted as a rooster. What this picture is saying to us is that America is the top cock on the block. And uh, we see all of the roosters in the background and uh, they're all in a circle staring at each other. There are like more coming over to fight. Because if you've ever had yard birds, you know, uh, you're technically you don't want to have more than one rooster. Sometimes chicken tax eggs and it happens. And so you know that when you have more than two roosters in a pen, they absolutely will have their own little cockfights amongst each other. And the minute they see, you know, if they see two start to fight, all the rest of them run over, you know. And uh, so that's what we're seeing. We're that cockfight that's starting. You, you, it's it's really hard to read, but each one of those roosters has the name of a Latin American nation written on it. And so uh, you know, it's it's indicating that, like I said, it's a, it's a satirical cartoon. So it's kind of making fun of America's stance on on their position. You know, it's making fun of them for thinking that they're the top cock. And so the picture is saying that, you know, all the rest of them can fight amongst themselves because the real rooster is the one that's running the hen house. And that, once again, is a, a very true statement, too. All the young roosters are going to fight with each other. The one that, impreg you know, that got the, the that, that impregnated its eggs with the chicken to have the baby roosters, the dad rooster, he really does like what them fight it out. It's not until they challenge him that he's then going to, you know, exert his authority. So uh, just to really, I like these uh, sub, uh, uh, satirical political cartoons. It really gives you an idea of what, of what people were thinking at that time. And, uh, you know, it's really great examples of yellow journalism and just how historically governments have always used propaganda in some form 
and to send messages to its citizens. All right, so just as I was at perfect segue there. So we know as American imperialism is becoming more interested in the Caribbeans and Latin America, um, they have to contend with Spain in order to, in order, it's not like they came, they went in like, oh, we're going to take you away from Spain and then we're going to dominate you now. It was more, once again, Uncle Sam, this buddy system. It was like, you know what? The Spanish are like treating you guys like crap. And so what we're going to do is we're going to help liberate you. And then once we liberate you, then we can set up a trade system of, of you know, these economic products and you can sell your sugar to and so that is uh, basically the Spanish-American War and American imperialism in a nutshell, because it did start off as, a, you know, America helping the Latin American Caribbean nations gaining their independence from the Sp Spanish overlords. And, uh, you know, just like we just saw in our last picture, you know, yellow journal was really, you know, media was really starting to take hold at this time. And we start to remember by the time we're at the Spanish-American War, um, I don't think, oh, dates are failing me. I'm so bad at dates. I don't think that radios, no, radios weren't really, uh, didn't really get invented until World War I. So, yeah, so at this time, newspapers were the only way that people could communicate. You got to think of it like newspapers were the most primitive form of, of social media out there. And, and, and actually, I think that's a good analogy because a lot of ways that people got to express their opinion and share it with others is you would you would write editorials to the newspaper and surprisingly guys newspapers still exist and you can still do this but people will write their letters and talk about what they thought about a story or talk about what they think about some kind of event going on and then the the newspaper would print that and so you know that played a big role in the Spanish-American War, and especially when it comes to the liberation of Cuba. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, wrapping up on the Spanish-American War, of course, just like with any wars, there are, there, there really is no good and bad guy because there are heinous things that happen on both parts. And, you know, some of that is just because, like, if you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat with somebody, it doesn't really matter what your culture is. It doesn't matter what you're there fighting for. At that point, you're, you're amygdala, your basic survival skills are so alert. Your, your stress, cortisone, your adrenaline, epinephrine, it, you know, all those stress fight or flight hormones and neurotransmitters are all activated that at that point, you know, you're the only thing on your mind is surviving is, is, you know, you're going to die or that person's going to die. And so, you know, it puts individuals, common people in very difficult situations. That's why, you know, we see a lot of PTSD associated with very traumatic things like war. And I uh, really, at this point, oh, just a little side fun fact for a second here. So uh, by this time, uh, mental illness really still wasn't something that was talked about. It was still kind of like this supernatural, kind of like possessed by the gods and demons type things. And pretty much, and like just, it wasn't really until about the 1800s we started to see this moral revival of how, you know, people who are sick mentally are treated, but probably about in the 1700s, people were pretty much just locked up in dungeons, like in prisons, and, uh, you know, tortured, and uh, stuff like that, you know, psychology was, it was very, very young in its infancy, too, so once again, I just bring that up, because uh, there's a lot of, uh, I, I, I 
think that maybe some of the undiagnoses of of uh, you know things like PTSD, you know, World War One they called it shell shock. But you got to think about what about the Spanish American War? What about the Civil War? What about you know the Cuban Revolution, the American Filipino War, it's, uh, or Philippine War? It's like throughout all of those, people got affected and were somehow mentally affected, you know. And so I wonder what, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at, if that plays any role in like the violence and the dictatorship that we see, you know, in the, in, in the history of Latin America and the Caribbean islands. And then I also think that some of that violence and dictatorship just has to do with that original influence of the Spanish and the Portuguese and just how brutal they are. Like with evolutionary psychology, we do tend to think that we have generational trauma. We hold it in our DNA and in our genes. You know, there's like a gene for, you know, some, some type of DNA. Um, somewhere deep buried in our unconscious, we like remember happening to our people in the past and, and, and uh, even if we don't you know we, we still at least have the it had some kind of alteration on our DNA that that you know it can cause mental illness and, and you know so maybe that explains for a lot of this conflict we see it just goes back to that idea that you know, as a world and as a human species, we think we're so advanced, but really, you know, when you look at the history of humans, it seems like a long time we've been here, but we really haven't, and we still have a lot of learning and growing to do. So, you know, I, I would propose we're, we might here, even in the 21st century, still kind of be like adolescents young adulthood, you know, there's still a lot of things that we have to figure out. So, all right, so wrap up. So basically, the Spanish-American War, you know, the U.S. tried to uh, negotiate a peaceful settlement, of course, on behalf of the Cubans, remember, because we're talking about they were, they were helping the Cubans um, gain their independence from Spain, and, uh, you know, the U.S. tried to be diplomatic, and the main was sank. And so in this picture, in this picture, we see just uh, an old, uh, colorful, very colorful illustration of the sinking of the main. So, you know, that was pretty much like the final straw for America. And the interesting thing about this, too, is because they were fighting with, the, uh, excuse me, fighting with the Spanish down in, uh, you know, down, down in this island type area, it was a different type of battle from, say, like the Civil War, or even the Mexican-American War, because the majority of it, because it wasn't fought on terra firma, you know, it wasn't just to, to, terrestrial. A lot of it was naval. In fact, the majority of it was kind of these naval battles that they fought out in the east there. All right, and so um, once again, so as I was talking about with yellow uh, journalism and this idea of sending these letters to the editor, that is one of the reasons too that we see the Spanish-American War causing a lot of outrage, and it's because of Delome's letter that he wrote to an American newspaper. He pretty much he was the um, the Spanish minister, and uh, so pretty much like the the diplomatic guy, the liaison there between Spain and America, I guess is a good way to to call him. And so we wrote this letter that got published in the in, I can't remember which American newspaper, but one of them published it, and he basically was just criticizing McKinley. He he really you know didn't. You know, had some things to say about American imperialism in uh, Cuba, especially. And uh, so, even though the American people weren't really happy with uh, President McKinley's presidency, you know, seeing that letter just really outraged the public. And then, once we see the sinking of the Maine, that just really made the Americans mad. And so, that's why we see McKinley asking for war in 1898. And uh, so we have this uh, famous quote by Secretary of State John Hay calling it a splendid little war. 
And that basically, it's like a little tongue in cheek. It was like, oh yeah, we win this one and we're going to, it basically was like, not really a big deal, but a splendid little war because of the spoils of war. That's what I'm trying to say. Basically, what that means is that, you know, if one, they were going to be, a, you know, splendid, there'll be a great spoils, ha ha ha, kind of mad. It, it reminds me of like the, the evil villain mad scientist, you know? <laughs> And so, um, and talking about Cuba and American imperialism, um, I don't really have a timeline of, or not, not a timeline, but this is, and we're going to, I'm going to bounce around here for the ending of uh, wrapping up this slide. But, um, during this time, we pretty much see the same tactics of imperialism instituted in the Caribbeans and Latin America. So with like, uh, for instance, President Taft does what we consider, what, what histor historians call dollar diplomacy. So he really wanted to expand corporate opportunities overseas. And uh, they were really, uh, Taft was unsuccessful in doing that in Asia. So, you know, that really made it possible in Latin America, however, however limited inroads offset by political turmoil, you know, really um, dampened Taft's efforts to expand, you know, to expand American imperialism. With Woodrow Wilson, we consider him the struggling idealist, you know, he assumed that policies in the Caribbean that were, you know, essentially they weren't any different from Taft and Roosevelt. Um, and uh, as far as Wilson's foreign policies went, they really ignored those less powerful nations' right to determine its future. And, uh, you know, Wilson's relationship and uh, the, during the revolution, revolutions, you know, just, just really exacerbated those troubled foreign policies. And so, you know, with American imperialism, we see vast territorial gains, increased international prestige at little cost in American life. However, you know, there was great cost to the uh, African-American slaves, the indigenous people of Latin America and the Caribbeans, and, um, <clears throat> you know, those great groups saw great losses. And uh, when it comes to the end of the Latin American War, uh, goodness, American War, like I said, um, mainly a naval battle. Um, America did eventually win. Um, Spain relinquished Cuba. Spain also ceded Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines to the United States, and the United States paid $20 million to Spain for that. And you got to think about it. $20 million is a lot of money now, but uh, it was really a lot of money then. And so in order to end the war, of course, everybody always comes to terms with these things called treaties, and uh, these terms were set out in the Paris Peace Treaty there of 98. And in this slide, what we see is a picture of President Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders, and uh, basically, they, they 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 played a huge role role in the American Indian War Indian Wars in the uh, West and the central part of North America too, but they also came in and helped in the Spanish American War and they were rough riders because they they really were like just just kind of gang of thugs that would go around and just you know coerce and beat up people and of course you know they they killed a lot of uh, a lot of took a lot of lives. All right, so when it comes to America winning the war, this is, you know, imperialistic endeavors uh, uh, are becoming more that you, uh, more like, uh, in, more realistic, there's what I'm looking for, becoming more realistic. And so, of course, you have the anti-imperialists, and they tried to defeat the Treaty of, of uh, Paris there because they really didn't, they really thought that the only reason, you know, people, you know, America was interested in Cuba had to do with the sugar producers 
and other businessmen. They felt like we were violating the free will and the rights of the people there. And, uh, you know, they felt that, you know, somehow this was going to threaten American citizens too. All right, so in this slide, what we see is just a map that depicts those major, I'm looking at this in the presenter mode, so I hope that map is bigger when we look at it in playback mode, because right now I can't read any of it. <laughs> but I know what we're looking at are, uh, you know, those naval blockades of the U.S. that, uh, you know, that they were really blocking Spain there, and what looks like those little, like, I don't know, starburst or maybe like a little fire type uh, symbols on it. And those are where uh, pretty much like there were, there were major things going on during the war. And uh, what I really want to point out is you see how, A, it was going to be impossible for Spain to really kind of stay dominant with, Amer you know, because of American imperialism, because they're kind of blocked, you know, now that America was... Uh, a united front and, and was gaining power worldwide, it was going to be hard for them to start shipping past them because then you run into all sorts of issues of whose waterways belong to who, who, you know, when you have to stop to, to resupply your ship, who gets, you know, that's when you start getting things like levies and tax and fees. And, and so, you know, that, that all creates a lot of conflict and trying to keep that uh, economic flow of commerce uh, consistent, right? And so that's really, I think, the key to why the U.S. won this war is due to those neighbor states there. And so, yay. America liberated the Cubans from the Spain. Sadly, though, we see that um, the Americans really were no different from Spain. So, you know, they started out as uncle and turned into authoritarian dad. And turned into authoritarian dad because, you know, they really, America at this time really just wanted to keep, wanted to take control of Cuba, you know, and, and of course, once again, a lot of atrocities going on. And uh, also, I want to point out uh, General Arthur MacArthur, General MacArthur there is um, a main figure when it comes to World War too, and that's because a lot of the military fame he gained here during American imperialism and the Spanish American War. <clears throat> All right, and so basically the McKinley administration, they didn't want to, you know, even though they had helped Cuba gain their independence, then they didn't want to relinquish the control and let them, you know, govern on their own. And so we see the Platt Amendment of 1901 that pretty much forbade Cuba from making any kind of treaties or deals with anybody other than the United States. And so, you know, the U.S. had really taken control of the economic and political affairs of Cuba. And uh, this is when we start to see U.S. naval bases in, in Cuba. And basically, basically, Cuba didn't have much of a choice in any of it because of their dependency on the sugar industry. And so essentially, Cuba went from a Spanish colony to an American colony. However, you know, if you remember, we said that uh, Spain also ceded Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines to America. And uh, we see that, you know, Puerto Rico wasn't quite under the control as other areas were, you know, Puerto Rico was uh, kind of given, a look, they're considered a commonwealth, so 
they have the right to self-govern, but at the same time, you know, now especially Puerto Rico, are they're a part of America. They they get dual citizenship. They they you know they're allowed to travel between Puerto Rico and America with you know no complications. It's it's just like an American traveling there. Like our our little sister or something used to say, all right. And then, uh, like I said, I know we're uh, around a little bit with our president, so I'm not going in an actual chronological order with them. But we know by the time we see Teddy Roosevelt um, winning the presidency, he's you know really a driving force. And the transformation of foreign policies. That's where we get, you know, the Roosevelt corollary. Ugh, I think I said that right. That was tacked on to the um, Monroe Doctrine there that pretty much, you know, dictated how America was going to interfere in Latin America and the Caribbeans, right? And, you know, once again, it was all about this idea of keeping the European powers out in America. It's as a very dominant, as you know, a dominant force and in control of the world. All right, so what we see on this slide is just a map of those U.S. protections, the, uh, you know, the, the areas that the U.S. had to intercept and, you know, during these wars, during this time. And so we see, you know, Cuba is definitely, Cuba is the one that's really highlighted and stands out there to me because it was a major, oh, a major win for the United States. And this is just, you know, getting them, because in a, in a way it's, it's like a stepping stones, you know, get Cuba, get those nations right beside Cuba, and then you just, you know, keep working. Uh, your your way south. All right, and so what we see in this map, it's a map of the world that shows all the different possessions and uh, which European powers were where. And like I said, guys, the way I'm looking at this in presenter mode, I can't read any of it. I know the green there is the United States. That's the only word I can make out. I think purple above that is Russia. But I can't really tell, and I'm not sure that Latin America is all in white. I can't tell which one that reads to, but hopefully when we view this back and playback, that will all be uh, big and clear. I sure hope so, but uh, like I said, just a map there of uh, the different European powers and uh, where they were, pretty much where they were in this part. Oh, I know why Latin America doesn't have it because at this point they gained their independence and so everybody's kind of fighting with each other like in the uh, late 1870s we see Peru and Chile are going at it and so Peru loses a war to Chile and they sacrifice they have to sacrifice these rich guano lands and you know guano is fat poop so it's a really good fertilizer grows really good crops so you know that's a major blow when you're trying to exert yourself as an independent nation based on some type of trade economic resource right you know they had to give that to Chile and then with the Cuban we see a really strict contrast to experiences in Brazil and Peru and a lot of that has to do with the sugar boom in the late 1700s and so you know Cuba was suddenly the hot spot for uh, colonial masters in Europe, the, Europe this is where everybody wanted to get their sugar from uh, prime land for sugar mills and so by the 1800s there are just sugar mills and plantations popping all up all over Cuba and then of course with that we see the importing of you know once again hundreds on thousands of uh, slave labor, uh, labor, you know, they were able 
breed themselves. And with this slide, we have pie charts of those investment dollars. So we see how much money was being invested in different parts of the world based on these products. And then we see what those different products being um what the money is what those products are that they are investing in and so we see during this time i think this map 1914 is what that says so here by the beginning of the industrial revolution we see that a lot of global investment in latin america and the caribbeans and then we see that um you know there are a lot with mining and what's that say smelting and then railroads too we have to remember that as these countries were gaining their independence, as uh, you know, America was enacting imperialism in Latin America, Latin and, and you know the whole world was industrializing. Latin America was industrializing too, and so to make transportation easier, there were a lot of railroads being built in Latin America in the 18 and uh, 19, early 1900s there. So what we see with this slide is just a uh, an old illustration of different Cuban leaders during this time. And so once Cuba had its revolution, um, you, we see um, different political parties being formed, populism, neo-popularism. And so in the 19th century, there's really, you know, we see this revolution. And so we then see a Spanish-Cuban-American war and uh, basically the imposition of direct or indirect U.S. rule over the island thereafter. So, you know, it was really about getting, it was really about Cuba becoming more independent and then like we said we know that that did not happen and so basically we see in the 18 especially early 1900s we see a uh, cuba sugar economy kind of has these periods of bust and boom some of that has to do with world war one then in uh 1920 the post-war price collapse um we see the united states military interfering in Cuba again that all has to do with that Platt amendment we talked about a few minutes ago and then and then you know we still see revolution up into the 1930s and it really isn't until we get to Fidel Castro in 1959 that uh, we, we start to see a lot of political, economic, and social consequences of the U.S. interference. And, uh, you know, this is where we start to see hostility being created between Cuba and the United States. And most of it just has to do with because Castro wanted a socialist system. And then, of course, that brings to the 1960s, the Cold War, and the Bay of Pigs, well, well just the Bay of Pigs, more so though, the Cold War and Cuba's role in that, because uh, Cuba, the building of the Berlin Wall, were two of the most significant events of the Cold War that really created tension between the U.S. and the USSR. So basically, by the time we get to the 60s in 1964, we have John Kennedy being elected president. And so basically, Kennedy's foreign policy was just increased military spending and, uh, you know, continuing those Cold War efforts of containment and uh, basically just uh, making sure that the Soviet Union didn't get more, you know, didn't gain more power above us pretty much. So that's where Cuba comes into play because Cuba was already the socialist nation and basically Khrushchev over in Russia was using Castro in Cuba. That was a very common tactic 
between uh, or come not between but a very common tactic that both the united states and the soviet union employed during the cold war they would take these lesser these these less developed nations and pretty much put leaders in office and, and kind of use them as puppets and so we see heinous things on both parties like you know we can't separate especially in latin america and the caribbean you can't stand back and say well russia was worse or the united states was worse you know they both did some pretty crappy things down there during the cold war and uh you know cuba uh was the center focus there because like i said khrushchev was basically using them um since uh castro was already a little was already more on the socialist side we have to understand that has a lot to do with american imperialism because capitalism didn't seem much like an option it doesn't sound like a good option for people that have already lived under a system of slavery so you know here in the early 1900s capitalism was all about the fat cat at the top getting rich off of everybody else and uh you know that sounds just like the slave system that these people just came out of so socialism was more about you work hard and there's not some fat cat that's going to take it all away from us we get it we the people that are working and busting our butts you know to make the money and to make sure that our families are taken care of and we're all you know food water shelter basic needs you know, socialism is more about the, you know, focusing on the people more, you know, other than focusing on just that small group at the top having control. It's about redistributing to the people, right? So that's why communism appealed more to people at this time because, you know, capitalism was too reminiscent of the slave colonial systems. And, you know, of course, like anything else in history, Capitalism has evolved, so it's not quite like that. Well, it is still in some parts of the world, but, uh, you know, not in all parts of the world, right? So anyway, so basically they wanted to, Russia wanted to bring, or the Soviet Union, excuse me, wanted to bring nuclear missiles to position on Cuba. So then basically they had the strategic position to attack the United States and of course the United States said no way in heck are you bringing missiles so the missiles are on route and Kennedy's on the phone talking to Khrushchev and being like you know this is going to start a war we will not allow this ship to cross our harbor and to put that missile in Cuba and uh, you know if you do you it's it's done you know you guys are done it's it's I'm pushing the red button and so it was a very tense afternoon. And then to add into that, you know, why the, the uh, Berlin Wall was really significant too, because uh, it, it was another incident that happened in the same year that uh, totally divided the, this idea of is capitalism better or is communism better? And with the Berlin Wall, you know, we see Germany being divided in half there, Berlin, Berlin being divided in half. And so it was very, you know, it was a play of powers. Like, okay, well, we're going to have this side of the city on the east, the Soviet Union side, and uh, we're going to govern these people the way we think they need because they've just come out of Nazi Germany and, you know, they've been through this fascism, and so we're going to turn them communist. And once again, that might have sounded great on paper. The reality of it was, though, that because of this tension between the United States and the Soviet Union, the common people suffered. Once that wall was created, the people on the East weren't allowed to go to the West and vice versa. You know, families were separated. People were shot dead if they tried to escape East Berlin and, and uh, so you know that just written and of course media is covering all of, of these types of events and you know that's just making those tensions just higher and higher and higher. All right and so basically um once 
that once the Bay of Pigs, uh, you know, it, it didn't happen. Nuclear war did not occur. However, America was pretty strict on Cuba. And so we issued an embargo. And basically what that means is that uh, nobody was allowed. No, There were no economic interests in Cuba whatsoever. And even to the point that, and you know, there for the longest time, you weren't allowed to Cuba had this like they they were like China there. They had a closed door policy to where no Americans were allowed to come into Cuba, you know, and um, you couldn't vacation there or anything. And you know, before the Bay of Pigs, once again, you know, because of the sugar, American uh, businesses did have a huge interest, and there were people that would go to Cuba and vacation and all that good stuff. And so once the Bay of Pigs hit, you get the embargo. So he was now shut off from America, and we don't really make it easy for them to, like, um, you know, get their stuff sh shipped off to other parts of the world. Though, yet despite that, Cuban economy did grow by six percent between 2001 and 2008. Wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm skipping time. I'm skipping around the timeline. Let's go back. Let's go back until about. The 1980s, this is when we see um, this, this uh, people opposed to Castro. There's kind of this whole Che Guevara's and people wanting to stand up to Castro because when the United States issued this embargo, it did create a lot of problems for the Cuban people, a lot of property and things of that nature. You know, before Cuba was successful in its socialist programs of getting free health care, free education you know, went with this embargo, they, they had a, you know, some rearranging. And of course, that's not easy when you have to, you know, abandon what you're doing and, and come up with a backup plan. That's going to make people disgruntled. And there were a lot of people disgruntled with Cuba and uh, Castro. <laughs> Excuse me. Castro's regime. And in response to the embargo, what Castro did is they took all these political prisoners and they set them off on lifeboats and sent them to the America. Now, what Castro also did as a ha-ha, screw you to America, is they let all the prisoners out of jail. They let all the people out of the mental institution and they did. They put them on rafts and pushed them off towards Florida and said, see ya. <laughs> and so, you know, that created, uh, that th there were then these mass, you know, boats of these immigrants from Cuba coming into America. And so President Carter at the time, you know, really had to make some snap de decisions on what we were going to do with these people. And so, you know, Jimmy Carter, because you know, he was a nice guy, still is, still does wonderful things. He is, he's the oldest living president. He does a lot of stuff with Habitat for Humanity, him and his wife, whose name I never remember, Rosalind Carter. Uh, I can't, can't rem ever remember her name. But yeah, uh, ex-president Carter, Jimmy Carter, is uh, has been monumental in Middle East talks and negotiations there in like the 90s and the early 2000s. And so yeah, that's also one of the reasons why he only served one term is because most Americans thought that he was just too nice of a guy. But, you know, in those four years, he was he was really trying to do some good things. So the Carter administration, they said, you know what, Castro, you're not going to get us. America, we are good and we do care about people. And so pretty much the Coast Guard, um, you know, Coast Guard, Navy, American Navy, they, they you know, helped all of these uh, refugees. And uh, so that's why we see this uh, huge Cuban culture in places like Miami, Florida. It has to do with, uh, you know, the, the, those uh, Vicente uh, there in the uh, about 1980s. And it's kind of, if any of you have ever seen the movie Scarface, it kind of starts out with, that's how Tony Montana gets to America. You know, Scarface gets to America. It has something, it has to do with the whole, you know, and, and things. So,
้อยเก้าเก้าเก้าแปดอะไรที่ไม่ได้ไปไหนเลยนะครับ so uh, basically uh, uh, basically we get to um, it's not until we get to uh, President Obama there in about uh, 2012 to 2014 that uh, we start to see Cuban American relationships changing um, we also see Cuba changing because uh, Fidel Castro has finally relinquished power. I always find it kind of funny too that throughout all of the Cold War and everything that's gone on, you know, from the 90s to, you know, the 20th century that Castro, Castro is like one of the few people that maintained power for so long. I'm like, I, I just always find that a little ironic and curious. And so, He, he, uh, his brother Raul Castro gets into power. Sorry, I blocked out there for a minute because I was trying to think if he was still in power. I'm not really sure. Everything that's been going on with COVID and stuff, it's hard to uh, keep abreast of world politics. I can't remember, but anyway, my point is, is that so during the Obama administration. We start to see Cuban American relationships changing, um, and it's and and so we're starting to negotiate talks, starting to get back on friendly terms. Interestingly, maybe surprisingly for some of us, it's not until Donald Trump is elected president that the uh, that the embargo on Cuba is lifted, and uh, you know. Trump is a businessman before anything else, and so I'm sure. I, once again, I don't have time to look into this, but I'm sure by lifting that embargo, he he probably somehow has economic interests down in Cuba. So that's by lifting that 60-year embargo. You know, American businesses are now allowed to uh, you know deal with Cuba. Um, you're now allowed to vacation and travel to Cuba, and uh, so that leads us then to looking at the future. So, what does the future hold for Cuba? And uh, Cuba, just like I think all the rest of us, you know, like I said, we're all still developing. We still have a lot of learning and growing pains to get through. You know, even guys, when you get to middle age, you get to elder adulthood and Until we reach the finer stages of development called death, you know, we all go through um, growing pains, and and life is a learning and growing journey that never ends. I think that's the true for nations as much as it is it is for individuals. And so, you know, Cuba is a very resilient culture. They are capable of adapting, even if they have sudden regime collapses. You know, they're uh, they've got a lot of gradual, market-oriented reforms. Um, Mm. They also have a lot of uh, achievements and social services. Like I said, in 1961, there was the nationalization of education, health, and other social civil type services like that. So all Cubans have free access to education, healthcare, social protection. You know, social development has always been. A, a priority for Cuba since it gained its independence back in the 1800s. There, um, you know, one third of their national budget is allocated to social uh, sectors. Cuba is actually one of the three Latin American countries in what is called the UNDP Very High Human Development Index. So they're just a little, a little above Chile. They're above Argentina. They're only surpassed by Uruguay, Costa Rica, and Panama. So basically, what that means is that you know they're really interested in taking care of their people and in helping people. And uh, one of the main ways that Cuba is uh, exerting itself and economically is in the biotech 
industry. There are actually a lot of vaccines and uh, pharmaceutical and diagnostic tools that are produced in Canada, as well as uh, they have a lot of um, commerce in the form of fish plants, animal, or not commerce, I'm sorry, uh, uh, like uh, environmental protection when it comes to their wildlife and, and things like, you know, the ocean life and, and uh, nature. And uh, although Cuba may struggle at times to produce its own food and, compute and, and consumer goods, Cuba always rises above and is always trying to, you know, do better for herself as a nation and for her people. And like I said, you know, with the way that they are exerting themselves in the biotechnological field and, you know, professional medical services, they, they uh, prove to uh, really be making them, they, you know, hopefully, one day they will uh, be a major contender and that ends our lecture for this week guys thanks so much for hanging in there and listening make sure you're getting in your discussions make sure you're including those apa elements and remember you can reach out for me for anything thanks guys bye